All right, everybody, welcome to another live stream here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel. As always, I am Josh Placer, and we got a very interesting cast for you today. We're going to be discussing video game addiction and kind of what's going on with the fallout of the ruling from the World Health Organization. And joining me to discuss this is returning guest, game economist, Ramin Shokuzad. Thank you, Josh. Hey, Ramin, it's great to have you back on. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing great. I just got back from Canada. It's lovely up there. <laughs> great. And it seems like every time I have you back on, we have some very serious topic to talk about. I think one of these days I just have you on for like a nice and friendly chat. We need like some like low energy topic to discuss. <laughs> well, I mean, the computer games are becoming a big deal and there's a lot of serious issues and I'm glad you bring me on to help explain some of them. Mm-hmm. And this one is certainly an interesting one. I know it's one that we've discussed several times in the past, and this is kind of like our first time, I think, dedicating a full cast to it. And that is, of course, the topic of video game addiction. And what elements kind of make that up? One second, let me just pop that out there. But it's certainly one that I know that you've been talking about for the last few years. I think um, on one of our previous talks, and you said that you wrote, I think, a thesis paper on it, or you made like a major oracle on the topic. Well, I mean, I've been studying mechanisms of addiction since uh, 1989, but uh, but not in computer games. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interviewed by NPR along with Dr. Valco uh, uh, about addiction in video games in 2013, and uh, that's when I also began advising international regulators. So I would say that's probably when I really started focusing my full attention on the issue of computer games and addiction. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that, as I said in a post or in a video that I put up about a week or so ago, for those of you watching this live, that when most people consider, or when we used to think about video game addiction, we thought about things from an MMO point of view. The idea of just playing a game like World Warcraft or EverQuest for 10, 15 hours a day and that kind of behavior. But we're also seeing more discussions about this relating to monetization and games that are designed to get people to keep on, to get, I guess get that allure of spending money and get those dopamine levels up. Well, I, I think there's a lot more chemicals uh, involved than just dopamine. That's probably the one that gets the most attention and probably the only one that's really understood at, to any extent by game developers. Uh, but there's a whole ho a cocktail of chemicals involved uh, and a whole range of physiological uh, adaptations that occur when you're playing computer games, especially for longer durations. And I don't think that's generally understood by developers, and I don't think a, a lot of work has been done in the area of understanding game physiology. Uh, I don't think I gave a complete answer to uh, N the NPR interviewers' questions in 2013, but in 2018, in January of this year, I published an article titled the physiology of gaming, which I attempt to uh, describe in detail the uh, adaptations uh, across the uh, the entire autonomic nerve system uh, when you're playing computer games. Mm -hmm. And I think to kind of get the ball rolling, Rami, I, here's one question. I'm sure this could probably be a 10 to 15 minute discussion in of itself, but one of the big things following the World Health Organization's ruling this past week was the argument over were video games inherently addictive? And I'm pretty sure I know what your answer is going to be, but for the folks either watching us live or recorded right now, what are your thoughts when it comes to that whole discussion if video games can lead or cause addictive personalities or addictive qualities? Inherently addictive? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Can be uh, designed to uh, in Increase their addictiveness? Absolutely. And uh, we put a lot of work into that currently. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess to clarify that, what do you mean by uh, not inherently addictive? I guess, what would be like your bench benchmark or your point for when a game crosses over that line? Well, uh, as I described in that recent article, uh, you can't even talk about addiction without 
understanding what, what that word means. It's thrown around pretty casually by people who aren't um, uh, don't do scientific work or clinical work in the area of, of addiction. So really, in order to even begin answering that question, I would have to make sure that you understood what addiction was and, and, and that our viewers understood what that is so that we, so we can better um, answer that rigorously uh, and instead of just throwing around blanket um, classifications that may be true sometimes and not true in other cases. It's better to understand why something could be addictive uh, because then you have the choice of either identifying if this is an addictive product or not and or uh, deciding whether you're trying to make an addictive product or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that would be a good point there. I, I'm i not going to try and pretend I know as much as you about the topic of addiction. I know a little bit, but I guess for you and for people watching, like, how, what is, I guess, the classical or the standard definition for addiction? The classical uh, definition of addiction involves uh, a behavior uh, that a person does repetitively that uh, it becomes so obsessive that it interferes with their other regular activities of daily living, these ADLs, uh, which may include things like socializing with your your family or community, uh, being able to go to work successfully, being able to sleep, engaging in basic uh, hygiene activities, uh, staying out of jail, yeah, <laughs> these types of things uh, are basic activities of daily living. And when an activity uh, begins to conflict with those things, then we begin to consider it addictive. That's 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 on a that's how clinicians generally define it. Um, I don't find that definition completely adequate uh, so I've delved a little deeper in my uh, physiology of gaming paper <laughs> um, there I, uh, I I I went after not only games but social media and and basically all entertainment I consider entertainment not to be a luxury I consider entertainment to be a necessity uh, entertainment is uh, your body's counter to stress mm -hmm. uh, the more stress you're under the more entertainment you need, uh, since we're currently experiencing uh, anxiety, depression, and suicide levels eight times what we were experiencing during the Great Depression. Uh, I would say we are we are under we are experiencing almost unprecedented stress levels across society right now. So that means the good news for us is that that means our demand for entertainment is also at unprecedented levels. So we could be making records amount of money. Uh, but we're not because we're not understanding consumer need and we're not producing products for them. We're producing products for us um, and we're not doing the best job of it. Uh, so, so when we talk about trying to make products for consumers, we need to identify what the core consumer needs are that we're trying to fill. And uh, that's the first place that we're failing uh, uh, quite dramatically uh, because we don't even know what those are. So how can you, I mean, if you try to make a, a drink for somebody, the, the, you basically know you're fulfilling a need for fluids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the most basic thing, but, but even that most basic thing we don't understand in computer games. So I identified the two core consumer needs uh, in video games. That was the first step. Those are power and connection. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we do a poor job of meeting the power uh, core consumer need, and an almost no, almost no success with with uh, the developing the connection. Mm -hmm. um, in game, in some of the older uh, massive multiplayer online games that you, we, you and I have discussed and described as like the golden age of gaming, like when starting with games like EverQuest and Dark Ages Camelot and and World of Warcraft, there was a lot of connection going on in those communities. Uh, were, were generally oftentimes stronger in their effect on a person than their their real space community uh, and that was because they were fulfilling this 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 need for connection uh, we've we've largely moved away from games like that um, because we think that we can make more money if we don't make those games uh, I think that's a huge miscalculation mm -hmm. um, so okay so a, a addiction occurs when instead of providing uh, 
a remedy for a core consumer need. Instead, we provide a, um, a stimulation that makes them feel good momentarily, uh, that makes them f forget that their core consumer need is not being met. And we just repeatedly stimulate them. Uh, in, in games, the, in some very simple games, that, that stimulation is adrenaline. But in most of the games that we're dealing with these days, uh, it's dopamine, which is the same stimulation you get by repeatedly smoking a cigarette or, or doing cocaine uh, or, or even sometimes from food. So by stimming a person over and over again, the person feels good while they're doing it, but is also uh, becoming tired, becoming exhausted, because by constantly stimulating the person, we're uh, activating only half of the autonomic nerve system. Um, the autonomic nerve system is, uh, as it sounds, the autonomic part means it's just kind of automatic. It's a, like a backup nervous system that, that runs in our body that includes a lot of hormones that helps regulate all of our body's functions without us having to pay attention to them, without us having to consciously think about them. Uh, the, the, the upside of the autonomic nerve system is the sympathetic nervous system. It's your fight or flight system. And, and it's strongly associated with chemicals like adrenaline. So when you're threatened or excited, uh, you release adrenaline and possibly also dopamine, which is another sympathetic nervous system stimulator. And this will increase your, um, your focus, your alertness, uh, but also cause you to pay less attention to your peripheral environment. It also uh, tends to fatigue you because you're running on overdrive uh, with the intention of trying to overcome some threat. Uh, but the body is not designed to have threats that last more than short periods of time. I mean, if you're fighting a tiger, <laughs> chances are uh, you're going to win or lose that battle within minutes. It's not you're not expected to have to fight a tiger for you know 16 hours straight. Uh, your body will do its best to deal with that type of an emergency but there's going to be serious consequences um, if you're doing it day and day and day and day over and over again then you're going to do serious damage because the autonomic nerve system is designed to flip between the upside which is the sympathetic nerve system and the downside or the, the resting side the healing side, the nurturing side which is the parasympathetic nerve system and the parasympathetic nerve system is uh is associated with hormones like insulin, which you get from eating, um, uh, oxytocin, which you get from connecting with people, which again, the, the, the very strongly tied to that uh, connection core consumer need. Uh, and just relaxation activities, like if you're getting a massage or taking a hot bath or relaxing, then you're pushing the, the parasympathetic nervous system into ascendancy. And the, the two sides of the autonomic nervous system are in competition with each other so you don't get both of them activated at the same time either when okay. when one's up the other one is suppressed when the other one's up the other side's suppressed so uh so addiction occurs when we keep hammering one side over and over again uh and and creating fatigue and creating an imbalance and one symptom of this imbalance is that just in the last uh 10 years we're now sleeping one hour less per per night uh, than all previous generations. Uh, that's a, a huge shift in our physiology, and it's a, it's a sign that we're we're spending too much time in the up position and not enough time in the down position, recovering. And without their recovering, uh, we're having experiencing increasing uh, immunosuppression, increasing anxiety, increasing depression, uh, increasing mental illness all across the board. And that's also reflected in. Uh, the lifespan for Americans has gone down the last couple of years. And this isn't because we're getting exposed to toxins or because old people are dying earlier. That's not the case. Old people are dying later. The reason the life, average life expectancy is going down in the United States is because young people are dying from mental illness related reasons. And definitely a lot to unpack there when it comes to addiction. Now with video games in general, as we talked about, the change in terms of how video games are being marked, how they're being designed, has certainly occurred over like the last 10 or so years. As you said a few minutes ago, Ramin, 
uh, we talked about kind of that MMO golden age of the late 90s, early thousands, with trying to get more of a social impact or a social connection with people and downplaying more like that heavy monetization. Now, when it comes to video games and game design in general, I want to get your thoughts on this. When we look at some of the best video games out there, I mean, for people watching us live record, we all have our favorite game, the one that we've spent, who knows, hundreds of hours playing. For people who play multiplayer games that we've talked about, you can easily spend several hundred to even several thousand hours over the course of a lifetime playing them. Now, when someone gets to that point of playing a video game, does that begin to call into question the idea of becoming addicted to a game? Because as we've said before, a lot of people who look at video game addiction look at the MMO genre, which are inherently designed to be played for hours upon hours upon hours. Well, let's use uh, let's use the, the game Civilization as an example. Um, I used to play Civilization. Uh, I used to have that have that just one more turn uh, effect so much that with Civilization, which I, I learned a lot about economics about uh, before I actually went to school for economics by just playing Civilization, um, even in the environment uh, because original games modeled global warming back in 1990 when not too many people knew what it was. Um, the the more recent versions don't even have it. They've removed it maybe for politically correct reasons or something mm -hmm. but um that's an example of a game where you could get really yes. immersed in it and play for much longer than you intended but it's not the type of game since it's turn-based it's not the type of game that puts you under constant uh uh mental stress it's not constantly threatening you and, and telling and putting timers up saying you have to do this turn or do something within a certain number of seconds or you are going to lose something uh, you're, you'll be harmed. So uh, it, the turn-based nature of it means that, that even though you can end up playing it a very long time, uh, you're not uh, suffering the same type of uh, physiological stress or uh, adaptation or, or even damage that you would be playing if you were playing a game that was designed to uh, repeatedly threaten you in order to keep you from blogging out. Hmm. And I think that's a very interesting distinction when it comes to what we look at classic games that are very popular due to how many hours you can spend playing them versus what we see today with the more of the heavy monetization aspects. And again, as you said, that constant threat of trying to keep your interests. Now, one of the things that I know a lot of people will bring up when it comes to video game addiction and this kind of argument is the idea that uh, people who become hooked on video games, the ones that get featured on news pieces and are usually the, the constant subject of this focus, that you know they will say something along the lines of, "Oh, if you you know if you were an alcoholic, you would be you'd be hooked on that." Like it's the addiction is part of the person's psyche rather than inherently with whatever the object or the source of it is. So when people start discussing that, like what are your thoughts on like that particular defense or criticism whenever we talk about addiction? Well, uh, uh, even the World Health Organization classification and pretty much everything I see in media uh, seems to be worded in a way that blames the consumer as if they had some sort of weakness or vulnerability or, or deficit that made them uh, become addicted because they're just prone to addiction. Uh, what, what's missing in this argument is that through technology, we can boost the addictiveness just like we did with cigarettes because cigarettes used to be far less addictive than they are now because uh, before uh, only a very small percent, I think it was uh, uh, somewhere in the order one to two percent of the nicotine was bio, uh, biologically available before the research in the 1960s revealed uh, that that was the uh, addictive ingredient and then they were able to freebase it with urea to make it all available and so our current cigarettes are 50 to 100 times more powerful than cigarettes from 50 years ago and so you could say well okay 
you know, the person was just, uh, you know, had an addictive nature when they're smoking. But really, anyone who's smoking with it, with that much nicotine, anyone who's smoking for any extended period of time is going to uh, uh, experience an addictive uh, reaction to that because it's just that powerful. We're, we're, we're getting to the same point with computer games as we're uh, uh, tinkering with dopamine uh, that we're, we're creating something very similar. Uh, though uh, the only good thing about that whole scenario is that we haven't, with a very few exceptions, we haven't uh, started hiring neuroscientists in the game development process in order to optimize uh, dopamine or any of these other chemicals, uh, their delivery during gameplay. Uh, that's going to change very soon. And, uh, uh, and obviously I, I do that in, in, in in the games that I design, but in my case, I'm I'm constantly aware of the uh, potential ramifications of what I'm doing. So I'm always trying to make sure that I'm not stressing the player uh, when I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. So so but I don't like this blaming the consumer thing because it's yeah. it's the problem isn't isn't the consumer. Anyone <laughs> is vulnerable to these methods, especially as they get stronger. Mm -hmm. And as we've said, I'm sure will come up in our conversation today, it has gotten more and more prevalent over these last few years. Now, here's an interesting question from chat. Oscar asked, are there, and this goes also back to what we were talking about with the social aspect of getting people to play video games. Is there any correlation on toxic communities like some MOBAs when it comes to addiction? He's saying, like, well, the game can be addictive, but there can also be that push by the community, such as, I think some of this, his examples would be, like, when people say, no, you must sit here and play this game. No, we need you for, like, another run or another raid. Or even just the constant assault by people saying, you know, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing this right? You so-and-so and more colorful language and we can really talk about. Okay, well, uh... Of course, if you're creating a game where there's stresses involved, especially if there's pressure to play, that goes all the way back to like uh, World of Warcraft, where you'd have these massive raids and you 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 couldn't log out during an eight-hour raid without people getting upset with you. So uh, uh, that's that's a physiological stress, but I don't think that really uh, rises to the level of toxicity. What you're seeing now with toxicity is. Uh, due to a lack of understanding of another uh, uh, chemical that's mood altering uh, other than dopamine that's actually more powerful than dopamine called oxytocin and oxytocin is often described as our, our social or, or love hormone because uh, oxytocin is uh, uh, when you share affection or touch or just connection with another person you get a release of oxytocin especially if it occurs in real space but there's also evidence that this can be triggered digitally because the brain really can't tell the difference between what's real and what's digital because it's all the same input it's your, your brain is is a, a several pounds of meat floating in fluids in your head and it's dark in there there's no light there's no sound all you're getting is nerve impulses and all these are just interpreted as best as your brain can to make you feel like you're seeing something or hearing something uh, it, but these are just nerve impulses coming in and, and many things can alter the effect of those nerve impulses such that I could show a, a, a video or, or put somebody in, in, a, in a people in a certain situation ask 10 different people what their experience was and I get 10 different answers uh, because there's 10 different realities uh, because reality doesn't exist for humans we, we do our best to approximate it mm -hmm. so uh, when when you were dealing with toxicity what's happening here is is uh, oxytocin makes you feel more vulnerable uh, and uh, towards the people around you and you're much more willing to be uh, giving to those people uh, you're even willing to self-sacrifice if you're, if you're generating enough oxytocin in the moment uh, this is why uh, humans have this ability to put themselves uh, between their children and the tiger uh, knowing that they may be first facing almost certain death uh, because under the effects of oxytocin, you uh, you get so high uh, and you become so interested in helping those around you that you consider as being part of your tribe that you will do anything to, to help them. Uh, 
it, it, tapping into that um, commercially could be extremely advantageous to us because if you could get the consumer to consider the developers being part of the tribe, they could just hand over all their money to you. Um, but the problem here is in the perception of tribe. And uh, a, a tribe is anyone you feel very close to that you consider to be your family. And uh, our society is increasingly promoting um, fear, division, uh, narcissism, the consumerism, these perceptions that, that you come first. You should be the winner. Uh, you deserve this. Uh, and, and these types of things are causing the, the concept of tribe to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And in a game uh, like a MOBA, uh, generally uh, your tribe could just be a few people or if it's a randomly generated uh, teams, it, it could just be you. And so everyone else that's not in your tribe is considered what I call Xeno outside tribe, non-tribe. And the, the, what the fascinating part about oxytocin that we're just beginning to learn that you, you don't you hear from very few sources is that oxytocin actually flips upside down and triggers aggression towards anyone that you, is, you consider non-tribe or Xeno. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same hormone that you might consider the love hormone is actually a, like a killer hormone in that it, it, it'll, it, it it will cause your tribe to unite in order to repel the tiger, uh, the tiger being seen as Xeno. And, and this is a, an incredibly powerful survival trait, but misused in a game, which is extremely common because this isn't understood by developers, uh, they're creating this um, aggression effect inside the game. And we're calling this toxicity, uh, but this is just absolutely normal biological reaction to these types of I would say, um, hostile environments that we're creating intentionally in our computer games. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and that's very interesting what I mean about that kind of mentality due to, as you said, like becoming that tribe. Because we see this in a lot, not just in video games, but with this idea of elitism and groups. You know, if you're a part of our group, you know, you're our best friend, we love you, but everybody outside of that who cares about it and there's probably a greater discussion about uh, sociology right there that we could have but it is a very interesting topic when it comes to as you said when it comes to video games a lot of game developers I'm sure as you said don't really understand this stuff because again game design is still a relatively young industry a relatively young study when it comes to its impact on the consumer and I know one thing that we've talked about before, I know you've written several pieces about this on Gamma Sutra, is that it can be very hard to strike this conversation up with people, especially with game developers, who are just trying to put a game together, and they're not really understanding the long-term ramifications of this. And I guess here's a question then for you. When it comes to like multiplayer games, as we said, with developing that uh, tribe-like behavior, how do you counter that, or is there a way to counter that? Are we talking about uh, from the perspective of the designer, or, or just as the community in general? Uh, let's go with designer first, with the people who are actually trying to develop these games. Well, I would say if the, if the developer is conscious of dopamine effects, and, and very few are not at this point, uh, and they're thinking, okay, well, we can, we can trigger dopamine releases say through loot boxes, which is a very common method. Uh, um, going back to research all the way back to Skinner from 1930, 1931. Um, if, if we want to use these methods to increase engagement, that's the nice word for it. Um, uh, basically, the developer is looking at this as, well, anything that's legal should be fair game. Uh, and so they do it. And that's exactly why regulators are stepping in to make these things not legal because anything short of making them illegal is really not stopping this push towards uh, producing these sorts of things. And it is not unique to computer games. I and mean, we've seen the same thing with the tobacco industry, the food industry, uh, 
beverages keep adding chemicals to drinks to make them addictive, you know, not just caffeine, but all kinds of other things. Um, so it, it, this is this is a uh, uh, this is a drive to meet the needs of the consumer. I mean, if consumers didn't consume this stuff, then there'd be no market for it. But consumers also don't understand that these stims uh, are hurting them physically and mentally. And 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 that they're not meeting their core consumer needs, and they and they're not even conscious maybe of what their core consumer needs are. They just do it makes them feel good, and something that makes them feel good for only five minutes um, it may not be as useful as something that makes them feel good for five days. But it may also be a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible, so they use it. Mm-hmm. And as you said earlier, when it comes to this kind of imbalance that can happen, if you're being overly stimulated by oxytonin or uh, serotonin, or was another one I forget, a dopamine. Oxyto- oxytocin. I do talk a little bit about serotonin, okay. but most of the stimming that's occurring in the serotonin is occurring through the pharmaceutical industry, okay. which is doing the exact same thing we're doing in the gaming industry uh, and creating addiction through um, serotonin stimulating drugs instead of meeting the core consumer need that the consumer has. Okay. And when it comes to video games, and I just want to come back to this point, especially for people who may have just came in a little bit later when we first started. When it comes to the video games that are addictive due to quality, as in, again, games like Civilization, uh, I've played more than my fair share of roguelikes, and so on, those Mm -hmm. kinds of games aren't triggering this same kind of response because it's not basically assaulting the person. It's not uh, being aggressive regarding pressuring them to keep playing. Is that correct? Yeah, it's not It's not generating a huge autonomic nervous system imbalance. And and really, the, in the, the physiology of gaming, I describe this whole problem as being due to uh, uh, us creating an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system, which is serious stuff. Uh, but I would say the vast majority of doctors don't even really, mm-hmm. I mean, they don't really have to study the autonomic system, it's not autonomic nervous system that much unless they're, uh, they're you know, uh, involved in brain work or, or endocrine work. You know, endocrinologists would, would obviously have a much better understanding of this type of stuff. But these are, these are pretty obscure and a general doctor isn't going to mm-hmm. understand these uh, at that level and, and won't understand how games are triggering these effects either. Mm-hmm. So a lot of a lot of there's a lot of misdiagnosis uh, potentially occurring because, uh, uh, especially when you go far enough away from the real science, it's the neuroscience, and go to like psychology where they may not be aware of how these these hormones are creating these types of effects at all. Uh, so there's a potential for a misdiagnosis where, again, you end up blaming the consumer, not realizing that they're consuming something that's triggering this imbalance. Mm-hmm. And as you said, I mean, with a lot of people who don't understand that, that's what um, Oscar, I think, is pointing that he just pointed in chat, that the line is very thin between something that's very engaging and something that is very addictive. Because as we said a few minutes ago, a lot of people were blaming games like World of Warcraft and EverQuest back in the day for being, you know, addictive and doing all those various news pieces. So... As we just said, some of the best games are not addictive because they aren't assaulting someone. They're not pressuring them to keep playing. But what are your thoughts when you saw those news pieces pops up, uh, popped up regarding you know World of Warcraft addiction or MMOs are driving people to be less social and stuff along those lines? Well, if you want to go all the way back to 2003, 2004, 2005... Uh, when I was seeing headlines like that, I was thinking, well, we need to do more re- research on this and under- understand what's really going on so we can find out one way or another instead of just speculating. And that was my attempt. Uh, but I didn't seem to see a whole lot of um, academic support for that for some reason. Uh, I don't understand why we're considered so fringe that um, that we don't need to be studied despite just how many people play computer games Mm -hmm. and that's a i think that's a very major topic and i know it's one that i've talked about here with game wisdom that a lot of people still view uh, game design the game industry as more or less you know like a toy or a niche something that is aimed for the kids but why should we need to study it further and i could certainly go on my own personal rant about 
needing to do more study and more discussion about some of the finer points of what it means to design a game. And I think when it comes to these kinds of topics, a lot of people view the game industry, again, as something that doesn't really call for that much study. And for developers, I'm sure I've said this before, I'm, and for people watching us can agree that game developers certainly don't like to, I guess, be restricted in some sense, or to have things be defined. The whole argument over what is or what isn't a video game is a never-ending discussion for some people. And I think there must be some pushback from developers, you know, when you suddenly say, oh, you can't do so-and-so because it's harmful to the consumer. Well, the developer might not understand why it's harmful to the consumer, yeah. and maybe we'll just want to say, well, uh, you can't prove it's harmful to the consumer because you haven't done 100 mm -hmm. studies over 10 years uh, to, to prove this one way or another. Uh, but especially uh, when it comes to children, uh, that's not the standard for how we, we, uh, we look at things. When we see that something's having a physiological effect uh, that we don't understand, we tend to err on the side of with children, the, well, let's remove this until we studied it to make sure it's safe, yeah. not to prove that it's unsafe, because uh, we just hold children to a higher standard. We really don't care so much what happens to adults, but at least with children, we, we try to use that higher standard. And so just saying that we don't understand the effects well enough yet to make a call one way or another is exactly why you would regulate this stuff, this stuff with children. Um, so it's not a defense. It's actually uh, exactly why regulators should step in until we can prove one or another. And, and, and I, I was, I was set to do um, chemical studies, uh, real time, measuring hormone levels in players in 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 the types of games we were using uh, at Wargaming in 2014. Uh, I can say that now because my confidentiality agreement has expired after three years. Um, and. Uh, uh, but the funding got cut off uh, right before we were ready to, to go with that. And I had a, a prominent uh, um, neuroeconomist uh, ready to go to, to bring his team in and start doing blood draws and everything uh, during uh, these uh, test runs where we're going to see, okay, what what is the effect when we play this game or that game or this or, or if we change this or that? Uh, because no one knows. We're just playing God with these products, so what I call digital drugs, and uh, we just have a very cursory understanding of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And like we said, it's just very hard to have these kinds of discussions, because as you said, a lot of people don't understand the impact, and it's, getting, and it's been hard to get actual research or credible research done, because I'm sure if we type in video game addiction on Google, we'll find probably a few dozen videos and posts saying video games are bad, just as we'll find half a dozen posts and videos saying video games are fine, as you said, blame the consumer about why they're getting hooked on them. Now, I have a very interesting question. Again, talking about that line between addictive and engaging, another big topic that came, I think it was like two weeks ago, was people saying that Fortnite was going to, was like the latest, you know, big threat to children. And with something like Fortnite, while it does have some of the basic pools of a free-to-play game, you have daily rewards, you have uh, leveling systems and stuff like that, I don't think I would view that game as being predatory in the same vein as a lot of mobile and free-to-play games. But I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on kind of like Fortnite's design and that uh, progression model they use to keep people engaged? You know, I haven't played Fortnite because I don't like first-person shooters uh, I get overstimulated mm -hmm. uh, uh, so um, I, I personally find my adrenaline levels get too high I get uncomfortable so I, I will test them when I have a, an academic or professional need to uh, but otherwise I don't generally okay. play them uh, but but to answer your question I would say that you need to be conscious of for instance how high does your heart rate get while you're playing a game the higher your heart rate gets during gameplay and I'm, most people probably never measure it, uh, but uh, then the more often you need to take breaks. And if a game is designed to discourage you from taking breaks, uh, and in some cases actually punishes you, 
uh, for being offline, then those are games that are designed uh, uh, to be addictive in a way that's harmful to the player. Uh, I know of many uh, uh, online competitive uh strategy games uh, where you have assets in the game space that uh, can be attacked at any time. If you log out, uh, then you can be attacked without your being able to defend those assets. Uh, this is intended to create uh, an almost continual level of engagement, 24 yes. hours. Uh, and these are the most harmful types of games because this is going to prevent uh, a competitive player from uh, sleeping and they're going to be under constant stress even when they're not logged into the game because they're not when they're not logged into the game they're going to be worrying about whether they're being attacked and whether you know months mm -hmm. of work could just be erased uh, just because they decided to take a nap yes and I know a few examples that I've played over the last few years all those kinds of games and as you said Rami it when they get you hooked like that it can become very it basically just takes over your entire life. And I think that's a really good point when we talk about that difference between engaging and addictive. With a game, again, like Civilization or a grand strategy game, I can turn that off at any time and the world is frozen. I don't have to log in to play Civilization every five hours or my Civ gets nuked. But yes. I've played games... Um, I don't know if you've heard of this one, but for those of you who are watching, you probably know I brought this one up, but Marvel Puzzle Quest for, I think it was on mobile, and I know it was on PC as well. Played it quite a bit, yes, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm sure you know <laughs> of some of the, how the competitive tournaments work, that you are always going to be, the higher your ranking gets in a tournament, the more likely you're going to be attacked. And if you get attacked and your team gets and your team loses, you lose points that can be contributed towards the grand prize of that tournament. Yeah, so I'm what, currently I'm currently hooked on Marvel Strike Force. Uh, I've fortunately <laughs> my phone can't seem to handle that, or it just crashed on me. So I have avoided that bullet at least. I've avoided that thing. I use an iPad. I use an iPad. That would drive me crazy trying to play a game like that on an iPhone. Uh, yeah, and what happened was, of course. At like the last 30 minutes to an hour for a tournament, that's when everybody gets attacked. So it was routinely that you would play the game, and then for that last hour, you would stay online and just constantly play matches to try and keep your ranking up. But let's say the tournament ends at 5 o'clock in the morning. Well, then you're waking up, or you're going to be up until 4.35 in the morning to play this game. Yeah, um, I set my alarm clock, and I get up, and I, if I have a competition that's time-based, I do exactly that. Yeah, and, but of course, like if you win. oh, who doesn't like to win? <laughs> that, that right there is the oh, don't uh, uh, Oscar in chat's probably gonna post one of my favorite quotes, and people will say losing is fun. That gets me started on a good twenty minute rant. <laughs> yeah, well, I need more players like that playing against me. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> when they lose to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, developers know this, so they introduce the monetization that you get a shield that keeps your account from losing points, but yes. you have to buy it per tournament. That's like the smoking gun when you when you see a game yep. that uh, has a shield that prote it protects you from attack for maybe an hour, two hours, mm -hmm. sometimes up to a week. Uh, this is a smoking gun that they are selling threat generation, yep. and then and then, and then you know, we're using threat generation to put you in a threatened state, and then trying to sell you the remedy to the threat that they just put you under. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're very good at trying to get to blame another player for threatening you when it's really a developer that created that threat, not the other player. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, we got a comment in chat, I think this kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier regarding that addiction versus engagement. And uh, Janshvik put said, MMOs are addictive also because if you're paying a monthly subscription, you want to get the most out of the money you put into the game. Now, again, we've both played our fair share of MMOs back in the day, but uh, do you consider MMOs at that level when you have that, uh, essentially you have that countdown of how long you have to play the game each month. Does that become stressful or addictive to the person? <laughs> I think there's uh, some sort of a buffet effect where if you, you it's all you can eat mm -hmm. when it, when the gameplay is all you can eat and uh, then you tend to want to gorge yourself to try to get as much as you can because once you paid 
it's all free. Yeah. Uh, and then players will often try to complete all the content within mm -hmm. as short a period of time as possible. Uh, it, when World of Warcraft came out, I was one of the first hundred people to make level 60. Uh, but I did that by playing 22 hours a day, eight days in a row. Um, uh, for me, that wasn't because I was addicted to the product. That it, it, it was because I wanted to win. Mm -hmm. And I did. I mean, I was in eight days. I was level sixty. The next person on my server to reach level sixty hit it two weeks later. So I was, you know, I was I ruled that server, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody knew my name for, you know, for months. Um, uh, I like that. I mean, that mm -hmm. that 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 filled my core consumer need for power, and also to some extent for connection because oh, I yeah. was a celeb. I was a celebrity, um, but. Uh, that wasn't because uh, it was a subscription model that that occurred. Uh, you do get some binging uh, under the subscription model, but really that's not a, a, an issue of addiction as much as, as, as it's a problem for the developer because consumers can exhaust your content in the first mm -hmm. 30 days and then quit and they don't have any, they don't unless they build the enough social connection to keep them going and that's really honestly the only thing that's keeping world of warcraft going yeah. is the social connection not the content um then if they don't develop that social connection they're just going to churn out after the first month and you're not going to get any subscriptions from them mm -hmm. so it's that's my biggest concern with subscriptions is, is, is just that they're a poor business model not that they're um addictive mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I guess for me, I'm still, I guess I'm going on 14 years. I still haven't gotten a character to level 60 in WoW, so maybe I'll get there at some point. But as you said, I mean, when it comes to, like, the MMO space, especially with content like that, it is a fixed amount. And I think that's kind of what separates things from, as we've talked about before, with the free-to-play or when we have that very predatory practices, when it's just a never-ending hole of where you throw your money into. I know I've, I think this was either our first or second cast, but we talked about that example from, I think it was that uh, Alice in Wonderland, or, oh no, Wizard of Oz game, where oh, the more wrote, you... Did well, you read that article I wrote about that one? Yeah, I, I think I looked that up on Gamma Sutra, I think right <laughs> after we talked about it. But that whole idea that it, as you said a few minutes ago, with that smoking gun, when you see developers sell people essentially the cure to the problem that they originally designed, and then you can just keep adding costs to that based on whatever that person's level is. And I mentioned when I was trying to play that South Park phone destroyer that I was seeing prices at about like $20, $30. <laughs> That name did it. That name cracks me up. <laughs> <laughs> and you were saying that the more somebody plays, that that cost can keep escalating. Like they can charge. And you said someone had like a hundred to like four or five hundred dollar microtransaction in the game to just keep trying to get them to spend for power. Well, I mean the. the... The, the whole thing with the you know pay to win is mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, you're and, and especially with threat generation is you're intentionally creating an uncomfortable environment yep. for the for the player and this goes all the way back to to you know Zynga with their fun pain uh, with Roger Dickey which I've been writing about for years um, uh, but this is the whole idea that that if you torture your players enough and create enough anxiety then you can then sell them things that reduce their anxiety uh, and this is um, I don't know if I want to describe this as an addiction mechanism it's more like a torture mechanism uh, and and but players can get stuck in this and and feel invested enough that they don't want to lose what they've already invested mm -hmm. if they if they're if they're if it happens early enough they're like screw this I'm out of here yeah. But if they have a lot of assets and if they've already spent some money and they've got a lot of time invested and they may have friends in in in, in the community, if they're under sufficient threat, they're not they're less likely to just throw in the towel and they could end up throwing a lot of money at the situation uh, to try to mm -hmm. reduce the stress they're under. But this usually just creates uh, causes the game to adapt by putting them under even more stress to make them spend even more. Yeah. And uh, it, it, some people. Uh, a small percentage of the population really are vulnerable to this and will just keep spending. And so some of these games uh, have actually been able to generate more than a million dollars uh, from some users who have spent on them. 
mm-hmm. um, which is just fin- fantastic when you think about it. Uh, but it's just a few people, and I would say that those people have a real problem. Mm-hmm. And at, with a lot of the competitive base ones, I know we were having a chat on LinkedIn about this with the quote unquote strategy genre on mobile, that a lot of these games will basically only allow you to get rewarded by winning. And of course, that's conditioning the player to think that if I win, if I lose, basically I'm wasting my time. So I need to always keep winning. And what's the yeah. best way to always keep winning? By spending money and upgrading your units. Mm-hmm. And again, it creates that feedback loop of just keep matching the player up against people who are going to be higher level and try to force that chance to lose. Because, um, for instance, I was playing Command Conquer Rivals this past week to tr- just to see how much that was kind of hurting that model. And it's that same thing where if I lose 10 matches, well, I basically wasted all that time because I have nothing to show for it. So, and I think what's interesting is that unlike the ones that we talked about earlier, like Marvel Puzzle Quest, uh, Command Conquer, that idle game, and so on, where they punish you for locking out, in this case, these games are basically punishing you for losing, in a matter of speaking. Um, well, it, these games primarily use a personal power progression mm-hmm. as their reward system. So when you are successful, you are given more power. And the idea is that you want to keep winning because if you mm-hmm. keep gaining power, then you are now more powerful than the people around you, and this in theory should reduce your stress level. But these games are designed so that you can never be the most powerful person because they will add bots or whatever they need to to make sure there's always a threat. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it becomes a treadmill where you think you're getting somewhere, but you're not. They're just putting you on a treadmill. They can hit the speed up button as much as they want. You never will will reach the goal of uh, peace that you're you're seeking. Peace through power will never be achieved. Uh, it, the more you spend, the the more threat you can be placed under because now the next time you're threatened, now you're more at stake than you were before. Mm-hmm. So the, the stress actually goes up the more you spend instead of down. And, and this is also very narcissism promoting because it promet, oh, promotes yeah. one individual trying to be the best or the winner mm-hmm. or whatever. And, 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 and that's why the both of the projects I have in development now, uh, I've, I've, I've come almost entirely removed personal power regression from these games now now the rewards go to your team and uh and the focus is all on team winning not individual winning so i'm basically uh throwing out all the narcissists from my games and all the toxicity hopefully with it uh and uh and going back to something that's much more natural for humans because it used to be that we used to to win as a tribe uh and see our tribe as being everyone we knew Whereas now our tribe is extremely small, we're very disconnected, we're very unhappy, and uh, and and narcissism is skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. Not not just because of games, but also because of social media. Oh yeah, for sure. And as we said a few minutes ago, nobody likes to lose at these games. It's just not a possibility. So it becomes, as you said, that treadmill that it just can never really end. And as we've said before. As long as numbers exist, you can just keep pushing things forward. Oh, the last month the highest level was level 50? Let's bump the cap up to level 55. Everybody got their cards to the full level? Let's add in a brand new one. And I think another major point about that kind of power progression is that it can. it's a case where the earlier you do it, ultimately it makes it easier for you to play that game. Because we see this with a lot of these free-to-play and strategy-based titles where the first person to get the most power or get the most power means that they can start squashing their opponents, which means they get more daily rewards. And as you said, it's power that breeds more power. And if you were the... Sounds like real life. Exactly, yeah. (laughs) Funny, (laughs) isn't it? It's kind of... Isn't that a uh, funny coincidence right there? And it just gets to that point where the person who keeps winning is going to make, just going to keep on doing that. 
And it actually brings me to a point that I wanted to ask you about, I mean, I was, I remember reading an article about trying to make these kinds of games like Clash of Clans, like South Park Phone Destroyer, Clash Royale, and so on, as competitive esports. And I remember I got some pushback from people when I said that this doesn't sound all that fair, like it still seems like it's very heavily monetized. And someone said, well, for the tournament, none of the people had to spend any money on power. But I'm like, but how much did they spend to get to that point? So I guess my question is, for games like we mentioned, like Marvel Strike Force, Puzzle Quest, and so on and so forth, can these games be viable esports, considering that kind of power progression curve that they're inherently built on? I would probably say no if you want to do esports you need to make a game that has no pay to win mm-hmm. like my world of warships design um has all the pay to, pay to win removed uh so that makes a great esports game mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and there's no reason why others can't uh use that as an example on how to build an esports game mm-hmm. it's, and... not a, it's not even a fringe game it's a pretty mainstream yeah. game so and i guess for people watching or listening to us right now how did you remove that power progression curve? I, now, obviously, you can't get into specifics, I'm sure, because of NDA, but what were like, some like general practices that kind of reduced that? It took almost a year to convince my, uh, my, my peers and superiors at Wargaming to completely remove the last pay-to-win elements. But uh, the first step was to identify all the pay-to-win elements, like premium ammo from World of Tanks, and then uh, just remove it. It didn't need to be there. It really wasn't a strong revenue generator. It was generating a tremendous amount of toxicity because every time somebody lost, they mm-hmm. they blamed the other side for using premium ammo on them. Even if they didn't, they may have lost yeah. fair and square, uh, but just the fact that they could, the other side could have cheated <laughs> by using premium ammo means that it's assumed that they did cheat by using premium ammo. So all this toxicity is being generated in World of Tanks uh, for no good reason. Uh, and, and and once you removed it, players are much happier, which is what I was trying to explain to um, the company when I was working there. Uh, eventually, they agreed to, to let let it do it that way in uh, in World of Warships, and it was very successful. Mm-hmm. I would also say that kind of stuff also creates stress on the person's end because you know that if you miss or you lose a match that you use premium ammo, well, you are now at a deficit. You spend money or premium currency to get that and now you've lost it and that can make things even harder for someone when they just keep on losing and that stress just keeps building well i'd be more concerned about the stress in the match where they're trying to decide should i use a premium ammo or shouldn't i use a premium ammo instead of just focusing on the gameplay oh yeah and that and that is probably extension of what we like to talk about when it comes to item hoarding in traditional single player and role playing games Mm where you will not use that potion because what happens if you need it five to ten hours down the line? <laughs> right, no, we've, we've talked about this a lot. It's a lot of anxiety over, you know, because we don't have complete information. We don't know whether, when would be the best time to use an item like that. Yeah. Like from, just using everything you've got when you've got it. Mm-hmm. Like for myself, I've basically forced myself to say, just use everything. Just treat every battle like it's the last one. And <laughs> I will say it's made things a little less stressful when I play yeah. games yeah, to go that around. <laughs> like, I don't care anymore. Just if this battle needs me to use 20 potions, I'm just going to use them. Like, just screw screw what's going to come down the line. Like, just YOLO it, I guess. Maybe that's the general strategy. Yeah, and, and if you have one of these power progression systems in the game usually the early potions you get are totally useless later on anyways exactly and again it all goes back to how developers are seeing either that fun pain or where these heavily monetized heavily monetized elements are and then just dialing that needle or pushing that needle even further and like as we've said not everybody is a can become susceptible to this like most core gamers or the hardcore when they see these issues it goes up like a red flag in their heads i know like for myself and probably for some of my fan base when we see this stuff when we see whether it's a pay to win element or something like the shield aspect from moral puzzle quest we know to just turn tail get the hell out there this game is done but as we've said there are people who are susceptible to this. 
and you're just kind of targeting them, or again, as we said before, with the quote-unquote whale phenomenon when it comes to mobile and free-to-play games, that if you know that this can cause stress or this can cause people to become addictive to your game, and then you just keep pushing it further, you're emphasizing it, that that's when we get into some very harmful and some very muddy business practices. Well, uh, last year I wrote a, a prediction paper uh, predicting that the mobile free-to-play market would contract this year. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for 10 years now, all my prediction papers have been accurate, uh, and this one was also. Uh, and the, one of the primary reasons I uh, used to explain that was because consumers are adapting to these mm -hmm. models and realizing that they, uh, uh, when they finish playing, they look back and go, that wasn't fun. I didn't like that. That was stressful. I'm happier now that I stopped playing. Mm -hmm. And so when they see the same type of mechanics used in another game, they'll be like, oh, well, why would I want to subject myself to that again? Uh, yeah. I mean, I went into quite a bit more detail in the paper. It's it's a mm -hmm. good read, uh, my data implosion paper. But the um, but that's one of the reasons why the, the market is contracting. Uh, but if a developer only has this one trick pony to mm -hmm. play, uh, they'll keep playing that trick pony because they're not going to want to lose their job. So they'll just keep playing that over and over again until it doesn't work. And now it doesn't work, which is mm -hmm. part of why some very big names in that space are talking to me right now, uh, yeah. where they weren't willing to talk to me in previous years and actually didn't really want me publishing papers on the yeah. subject in previous years. Uh, mm -hmm. But now they're kind of forced to talk to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Finish your thought. Oh, uh, so... I'm not sure what my other thought was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's the thing about the mobile market. I think another part of that is once you've gone through this all, do you really have the money? Not even just if you're still hooked on that kind of model, but if you just spent several thousand dollars on one game, do you reasonably have that money to do it again? And for a lot of people, that may not be the case. I, you know, if if uh, if if you've got the money and and you've got the stress, then you're willing to spend that money. That's really not the big issue. Yeah. I mean, the you know, are you spending on computer games? Are you spending it on uh, sexual partners or experiences? There's a lot of pe ways people can blow two thousand oh, dollars in a yes. very short period of time to try to reduce their stress level. Mm -hmm. uh, any of which could be addictive if they're not meeting the core consumer needs for power or connection. They're just stimming off mm -hmm. of that. Um, but the, the other point I was, I was trying to make uh, that I just remembered was that uh, if everyone's playing the same one trick on the consumers and uh, and there's a very small percentage, uh, I have my ideas as far as who those people are, and I'm sure you do too, mm -hmm. but, uh, 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 but we haven't done the research to see who's most vulnerable to these techniques. Um, it, it, if everyone's trying to hit the same few percent of people, uh, then those people are getting swamped, and there's not that many of those people to go around. Mm -hmm. uh, the same people that the casinos like. Oh, yeah. um, so, uh, so you're you're facing increasing levels of competition, uh, which means that what may have worked, uh, you may have the business intelligence to show that it worked a year or two years ago. It doesn't mean it's going to work this year. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing we said about the MMO crash of the last decade, when everybody was trying to be the next World of Warcraft and targeting that same kind of design. But as we've talked about before, why should someone play your game that's like World of Warcraft when I can just <laughs> play World of Warcraft? And mm -hmm. it's the same thing with the free-to-play and with any one of these popular genres. I mean, even the whole Battle Royale genre is gonna, could be a good example of this in the next year or two. Because right now, obviously everybody knows Fortnite, but I've heard at least four or five big uh, Battle Royale games coming out, let alone all the smaller independent developers trying to cash in on that. And there's only so many people who are wanting to play that game or willing to play that game. So the more people trying to target it, it means it's just less going around for everybody. Well, just on a purely commercial success level, uh... When somebody's first in the market, they get a huge amount of market share, oh, yes. like with Fortnite or with the, with World of Tanks or such, and and uh, that gives them a huge advantage in the market. So uh, my natural reaction is, if I see something very successful in the market, the normal reaction it seems to be is seems to be, well, let's copy that. 
my reaction is unless I can build a significantly better product mm -hmm. that remedies the errors made in the product I'm looking at, I make something completely different and aim at a different demographic. Because if you're aiming at making a game that's uh, aiming at a young male demographic and then everyone else is just dogpiling in there, then you've got a lot of competition for the young male demographic. But then you've got middle-aged women that are just sitting there twiddling their thumbs with all their money and wondering where they're going to spend it and looking to see what movies are out this week <laughs> uh, because there's no games that are, that are really attractive to them. Uh, but if I went in the opposite direction that everyone else was running and mm -hmm. set up a game for that demographic that they found attractive and met their needs, then I'd be collecting all the money yeah. until everybody started dogpiling on what I was doing. I, I would love to see a dogpile on, on games for middle-aged show, but it, it still has never happened because we make games for ourselves, not for our consumers, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the people making the games are mostly young, white men. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens that with the reason why the market works so well, again, is because it's just one of those cases where things fell into place. But yeah, that's a very interesting point. I think that could probably be its own cast right there in terms of targeting people outside of just the 18 to 30 straight white male demographic. And getting back to your point there regarding when you see that big name game, I think that's a very interesting thing or a situation with what happened with PUBG to Fortnite. Or even we could go further back with something like H1Z1 to PUBG to Fortnite. Where in these cases, the first game on the market didn't really take that ball and go with it. And instead it kind of let the door open for someone to make that very highly polished, very uh, elevated take on it. The same thing again with World Warcraft. That while World War Warcraft was certainly not the first MMO, it was the first one to be that polished and that refined in the consumer space, and then basically everything fell into line after that. Well, I mean, World of Warcraft also had a lot of problems, mm -hmm. and that's the it, it, it. If not for World of Warcraft, I would not have, have dedicated myself to developing the field of game economics because I saw so many problems with the economies in World of Warcraft mm -hmm. that I wanted to solve uh, especially with the gold farmer threat uh, mm -hmm. occurring and, and it, we, we decided that the gold farmer threat was un, was impossible to solve because we didn't understand it so I wanted to understand it so I spent the four and a half years it took to study it till I had a solution um, but then by then we decided that the that that problem was not only impossible but to solve but also uh, that whole genre was impossible to sustain. So, with the exception of World of Warcraft, there hasn't been a whole lot of uh, attention to the MMO space. Mm -hmm. uh, so, all that technology developed uh, that that part of it's just been sitting idle. But all but I've been developing new technology since then to meet the needs of developers uh, for what they're making now. But I still think they're just running around and not doing the most basic thing, which is asking consumers what they want. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's it should start there. It really should start there, and it isn't. It's instead we're asking each other what would make an interesting game, and that's not asking a consumer what they want. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the more interesting things that we see in the independent space with developers actually doing that, asking the consumers. We see this with a lot of games on early access, and a lot mm -hmm. of some of the first or second time developers saying, you know, they pull up like community questions saying, what features do you want to see in our game, or what aspects do you like, what you don't like and then moving things along that way. And that l level of transparency, I think, has been a very big boon to the independent space. Absolutely. That's why they're, they're, they're surging right now, and AAA seems like it's really uh, on the ropes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do a quick time check here. We are about an hour and, hour and ten into the discussion right now. <laughs> time flies. <laughs> of course it does. I guess... Are there any other topics uh, that uh, we haven't discussed yet that you think would be uh, beneficial to our discussion today? Uh, well, I mean, we're focusing on, on addiction, so I think uh, you know we did a pretty good job of hitting that. Uh, there's a lot of other topics that are trending right now that we probably shouldn't start into for this podcast, mm -hmm. like, for instance, uh, uh, Netherlands uh, you know, declaring that uh, loot boxes and trades... Uh, mm -hmm. Are, are illegal. Uh, um, that's something we probably should get into, but not in this podcast. <laughs> that's probably another hour, I think. 
Um, I guess for folks watching us live right now, in that case, um, I, I think I just have a few just general questions, maybe just to um, clarify for people watching or to drive the point home, but we'll probably wrap things up. So I'm going to put out the last call to any questions for us regarding video game addiction for this cast. So if you have any, uh, get them in now or we'll, or otherwise, I guess, say you're, <laughs> we'll move on. But so I guess to begin to wrap things up for today, as we've said, the market has certainly been shifting when it comes to the mobile space with trying to make these games less predatory. And I know we could probably go into even more examples of what we've talked about. I know we did this on our last cast. So I guess, in your opinion, Ramin, do you think that we are getting to that point where things will start to get better? Or do you think we still need like that big push or that big event to maybe start to, I guess, steer the ship in the opposite direction. Well, in my data implosion paper last year, I predicted that there'd be this correction mm -hmm. and that the correction would force the industry to adapt and innovate. And that's exactly what I'm observing. And I, I can't get into details because mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of information that's confidential. But I'm seeing exactly that. I'm seeing uh, uh, the big players realizing that the techniques they've used before are no longer working. So now they're willing to uh, look at what other techniques might be available out there, which is is great news. And the ones that are able to adapt to the changing market and the changing consumer demands are going to be tomorrow's winners. And the ones that stay in, in, in doing what they continue to be doing are going to be tomorrow's losers. And that's great for consumers, as you'll see a lot of companies disappear that were maybe popular before but aren't now. And new ones will come up and take their place. Mm-hmm. Now, here's a question, and I'm not sure we'll be able to get into this. It may be a little too NDA-breaking, but as we've said, with the uh, trends of the mobile space, I mean, we've we've seen things go from uh, pay-or-wait systems, timers, energy, to now the whole idea of, again, that kind of uh, holding you ransom or holding you hostage to keep you playing. I guess... For going forward, are there any like current or upcoming trends you think in terms of how things will change in terms of how these MMOs, or I'm sorry, not MMOs, how these mobile games will try to earn their money in the future? Well, I mean, the games I'm making, uh, uh, I'm, I'm aiming at a more mature, uh, uh, affluent demographic that wants to be able to, to have the same experience as all the games we just described, uh, but without the stress, uh, they can log out anytime they want, uh, without losing competitiveness. Uh, the focus is all on team building, uh, uh, much more on nurturing instead of competition, whereas most games today are 100% competition. My The games I'm building now are 50 to 60% nurture and 40 to 50% competition. Uh, so you're, I think they'll appeal to a much wider demographic uh, and a more affluent demographic. Uh, and uh, in free-to-play, that's exactly what you want because the, if you're going to pay per install, you want to get the biggest spending installs you can. And, and, and my objective isn't to uh, aim at people who have a, a psychological weakness that will make them easy to addict. My uh, target audience is smart people with a lot of money who have a limited amount of, of entertainment time but want to get the most entertainment value per hour and that's the why I'm making products to meet that need. Great. I'll be curious to see how things turn out and when you're ready to announce the games or when they're ready. I'll be interested to actually play them and see what's going on well, there. One of them I can announce is okay. Desti Destiny Sword. Uh, being made in, up in Canada. I just came back from Canada. Uh, we're modeling uh, um, physical and mental injuries uh, persistently from battle to the battle. So you, your your units will actually develop uh, injuries or mental problems or challenges, uh, stresses over time, and and trying to um, deal with those between combats is actually at least half of the gameplay. Because if you don't, you'll end up losing your units. Uh, and that type of care is uh, a much more realistic. Uh, though in real life, we often uh, treat real life 
combatants just like we do in computer games where we we spent billions and billions of dollars on engaging in conflict but then almost nothing on treating our troops when they come back and we end up having a lot of um, uh, people who are permanently disabled because of that it doesn't have to be that way so that's one game I'm building and uh, another game is a uh, it has some similar characteristics but it's a space uh, MMO kind of like EVE Online with all the boring stuff taken out uh, <laughs> and also all the narcissism taken out um, so that one doesn't have an official title yet uh, so um, we're probably going to look for a large company to help us market it and then they may have some opinions on what they want to call it especially if we throw an IP on it <laughs> alright well it definitely all sounds interesting can't wait to check things out um, Oscar and Chad said the, the game uh, Destiny soared with the idea of coping with stress and conditions uh, it sounds like Darkest Dungeon so <laughs> it, it, we, we do talk a lot about Darkest Dungeon but it, it's not going to be anywhere near as punishing as Darkest Dungeon <laughs> oh that's good then <laughs> Well, that helps my stress levels. I've been playing Darkest Dungeon this last week, as Oscar can certainly attest to there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think with that, again, there's so much more we could jump on. We could we could probably segue into talking about strategy game design, but again, uh, that will, who knows how long that will balloon this cast out to. But if you're always free in the future, I mean, um, again, the invite still remains open to have you back on. It's always a pleasure, Josh. Hit me up anytime. Awesome. So, I think with that, we'll wrap things up here. I guess, before we go, I mean, are there any uh, articles or pieces you've written lately if people want to check out more of your thoughts on this topic? Well, I mean, if you're willing to do a little bit of uh, harder reading, uh, I, I strongly recommend the two-part series that I wrote at the beginning of this year, which is The Physiology of Gaming, and then the part two, which is how to make healthy games. Uh, between the two, I create, I, I, I explain the problem and the solutions, uh, which is something I don't always do. I give the solutions to how to solve all the problems in the gaming industry right now. Uh, and um, some of those articles uh, weren't featured on Gama Sutra, so they were, it was posted, but no one got to see it. Uh, so it didn't get the type of exposure my previous papers did, even though I think this is probably the two two of the most helpful papers I've ever written for the game development industry. Okay. I just put a link to the How to Make Healthy Games in chat. And for those of you watching the slide right now, if you click on that, there is a link to the Physiology of Gaming at the top of that one as well, so you can read them both. But... Again, I think that will do it for today. Again, Rami, it's always great to have you on. These conversations, I think, are very key to have, especially, as we said before, with a lot of people who kind of dismiss like a more critical or analytical approach to talking about the video game industry and game design in general. Well, it's, it's going to become a science. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it should already be a science. Uh, you're seeing more scientists hired into the industry. And, and as that happens, uh, product quality will increase. Mm -hmm. All right. But uh, we'll have to save these, that discussion for another time. So we will wrap things up for now. I guess... Uh, one last thing, I know, I don't think you use too much in terms of social media, but do you do anything with uh, Twitter or anything if people want to follow you? No, I keep a pretty low profile. I got uh, I got death threats in 2001 after the 9-11 bombing just because of my name, and I went dark for uh, 10 years with an alias. So I'm not really um, trying to get a lot of attention on oh. social media. Uh, I know that's the counter counter to the what the the common thing is but just because uh i feel i need to protect myself and my family okay yeah, and that is certainly understandable so i think with that we will end things here if you wouldn't mind hanging on skype for like another minute after we end the stream we probably have some catch up to do there but uh for you folks watching us live or record right now thank you so much for tuning in if you'd like to catch this talk earlier and without any ads, be sure to check out patreon.com slash gwbicer, as my VIP supporters will get that early and ad-free. Uh, for those of you watching this live, I'll be back later tonight for another regular stream, and I'm sure we'll have more discussions with Ramin, whether it's here or in audio form on gamewisdom.com.
And if you are a guest wanting to come on to talk about any topic relating to game design or the industry, please be sure to get in touch. But that's going to do it for now. Tune in next time for another discussion about the art and craft of game design. But until then, have a great weekend, folks, and we will talk to you again next time. Take care.